Good morning, everyone. Hello. Uh, welcome to this session on uh, collaborative visualizations and visualizing collaboration. My name is Serenity Sutherland, and I'm both, I'm going to be doing two roles. I'm going to be chairing the panel, and I'm also going to be presenting. Uh, so thank you all so much for coming to our session. And if there's any point where you cannot hear me, both online or in the room, please let me know. I'm looking to my tech friends to make sure, all right, we're good. So. Uh, I'm just been really delighted to be at the conference, so thank you so much uh, to all of you for being here, but also to the conference organizers and for uh, accepting our panel. So I'm going to uh, first introduce everyone who is speaking on the panel, and then they are going to come up and deliver their presentations. At the end, we should have sufficient time for conversation and questions, which I'll moderate and uh, we'll pass around the microphone box for everyone to ask questions. So if you'll forgive me, I'm going to do the very awkward job of introducing myself, uh, and then I'll introduce my co-panelists. So I am Serenity Sutherland, an associate professor of communication studies at the State University of New York at Oswego. I am also the editor of the Ellen Swallow Richards Papers, which is a member of the Primary Source Cooperative at the Massachusetts Historical Society, funded by the NHPRC and the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. I am also the co-author of the Digital Humanities Project, Visualizing Women in Science at the American Philosophical Society, which we'll tell you about today. I have published in scholarly editing and interdisciplinary digital engagement in arts and humanities. I currently serve as president of the Association for Documentary Editing, and I am also an instructor for eLaboratories, a free online repository of courses on scholarly and digital editing. My amazing co-author and co-presenter is David Ragnar Nelson. He is a digital project specialist at the American Philosophical Society's library and museum. He received his PhD in Germanic languages and literatures from the University of Pennsylvania with an emphasis on digital humanities and the history of material texts. In his role at the society, he is responsible for developing and maintaining digital projects that highlight and make use of the library's collections. In addition to his work on visualizing women in science, the project discussed today, he is also involved in forthcoming projects on the ledgers and account books of Benjamin and Deborah Franklin, on historic weather records, and on developing a new interface to explore the library's history of science collections. Our next speaker is Christopher Ogg. He is a senior lecturer in digital approaches to literature at the School of Advanced Study, University of London, where he teaches book history and digital humanities for the MA program in book history and the London Rare Book School. He is the author of Publishing Scholarly Editions, Archives, Computing, and Experience, published with Cambridge University Press in 2021. And he has also published widely on scholarly editing, literature, book history, and digital humanities, and leading journals and edited collections. He is also the recipient of a 2023 NEH Mellon Fellowship for Digital Publication for his work on a digital edition for the anti-slavery literature anthology, The Bow in the Cloud. Joanne Bernardi is professor of Japanese and Visual and Cultural Studies at the University of Rochester. She has published on Japanese cinema, silent cinema, moving image and media history, historiography and preservation, Godzilla and nuclear culture, collecting and cultural heritage, and digital scholarship and pedagogy. She directs Reenvisioning Japan, Japan as Destination in 20th Century Visual and Material Culture, a collaborative multimodal DH project based on her original collection of tourism, education, and entertainment ephemera. And finally, Candace Hack is an assistant professor of history and director of the Digital Humanities Minor at the State University of New York at Oswego. 
She received her PhD in anthropology from the University of Toronto, and in addition to her own research on early medieval southern India, she is also a collaborator on the international project Epigraphic and Petroglyphic Complexes of the Upper Indus, Digital Preservation and Promotion of Written and Visual Cultures. So that's your uh, group today. I'm going to turn it over to David Ragnar Nelson, who is going to get us started with our first presentation. OK, thank you. Um, I want to preface this by saying that um, Serenity and I are going to present together. And we wrote this paper together very much in the spirit of collaboration and in the spirit of this panel. So um, just because I am saying something doesn't mean I wrote it. And just because Serenity is saying something doesn't mean she wrote it. So we're uh, mixing roles here today quite a bit. <laughs> so this presentation will use the project Visualizing Women in Science to ask a few questions about the role of visualizations in representing historical data. In many ways, visualizations are a form of modeling. But as humanists, we must, uh, we must ask to what purpose? and what or who is being represented. Additionally, visualizations are resource intensive, and this is a key point for institutions and researchers who are working on a limited budget. Visualizations require the expertise of many individuals, as our own project shows, and so what is the role of collaboration in modeling? The expertise of the individuals contributing to the project will determine the direction the project heads in, but to be effective, the project will ultimately need to meet the audiences they speak to. And finally, visualizations and modeling reflect the data on which they are built. In our specific case, the visualization can only work with what is present in the archive. And archives are not neutral spaces. So how do we as scholars ethically represent uncertainty or absence, both in the archive and also in the historical record, of course? While we cannot provide certainty to solve these questions in 15 minutes, um, we can demonstrate how our project contributes to these ongoing debates about the role of visual models in the humanities. So this is our project. Um, visualizing women in science is the culmination of a multi-year effort to highlight women scientists in the collections of the American Philosophical Society's library and museum. The project recovers the narratives of women scientists marginalized in the historic record by mapping and visualizing collaborations and connections between women scientists. The APS's library houses over 9 million manuscripts, the vast majority of which cover the history of 20th century sciences. The collections are particularly strong in genetics, the biomedical sciences, and physics, all of which are represented in this project. Additionally, the APS holds the paper of seven, the papers of seven Nobel laureates including the papers of Barbara McClintock, a geneticist. But despite the sheer number of manuscripts, women are not always well represented in the collection. Around six collections from women scientists are currently fully available to researchers at the APS. So that's only six out of hundreds of collections, so it's a very small number. Um, yet these six collections only encompass a small fraction of the achievements of women attested in the archives. Um, while these holdings offer great promise for research, traditional finding aids are not always well suited to this task. First, finding aids only show the information in the collection level and do not show larger connections or coherences between collections. A researcher may not be aware that one person is documented in multiple collections. Additionally, finding aids group letters around single individuals and do not show the multiplicity of relationships that might be present in those letters. After all, letters do not only document communication between two individuals, but may also make reference to the larger network these individuals participate in. That's a lot of what we're looking at. We're looking at things like letters of recommendation or other institutional correspondence that actually involves larger networks. Representing these collections visually, therefore, marks an attempt to provide a different mode of access to the collections one we believe is well suited to documenting individuals whose role might otherwise be marginalized. Not only does the project visualize historic collaborations, its building was also a collaborative effort. The core development period involved the work of content specialist and digital humanist, Serenity Sutherland, uh, <laughs> technologist and digital humanist, David Nelson, myself, 
and my boss, archivist and digital project expert, Bayard Miller, who can't be with us today. Um, in addition, the project was developed in collaboration with the museum staff at the APS. The project's launch coincided with the launch of the APS's museum exhibition, Pursuit and Persistence, 300 Years of Women in Science. I have swag, if anyone wants swag. And a static video of the main visualization that we're going to discuss later plays in the entrance of the gallery space. Users may as access our project via a QR code. Early analytic data for the project is strong compared to other APS projects. Um, this is a little tiny, but um, since the project launched in March, the project has had 1,029 unique users with 276 users for the visualization itself, so about 27%. The museum's role in driving engagement is unclear. Visualizations are inherently difficult to translate to different screen sizes, and users may not be able to fully engage with the material on their mobile devices from a scanned QR code. The QR code has received over 140 scans since the opening in March, which is extremely high compared to previous APS exhibitions. Our previous exhibition, the QR code only had 50 scans in October, so um, this is very good. Um, but given analytic data, it seems many scans only go to the homepage and do not engage with the content beyond that. Nonetheless, both Visualizing Women in Science and the accompanying museum exhibition view collaboration and networking as key to women's successes in science. We therefore created a network visualization, even though the underlying data is not a rigorously constructed social network. Indeed, we attempt to be very careful in the rhetoric we use to present the visualization. It is not a social network in the sense that we can measure degrees of closeness through proximity in nodes or edges, nor is it a complete representation of women's access to science. As noted by Johanna Drucker, which I'll summarize quickly in my talk but can't include, um, but the full quote is here for you to read, Visualizations are static and can't fully capture complex processes that change throughout time. However, this may be a limitation of many of our tools of historical analysis. In other words, while our specific network cannot model historical relationships as such, it can model the mediation of these relationships as portrayed within the archive. And it can, it can provide an engagement to a wider audience than academics that women have been involved in science for a long time and their work has not been fully captured in the historical record. Additionally, such close attention to archival materials has led to the recovering of women in science who were not previously known, as we'll talk about later. So, how do we do this? Visualizing women in science started with five core collections from women scientists who you see up here. We don't have time to go into all of these people, but their names are here, and I can talk about them during the Q&A, Ask in Serenity. Um, Sutherland meticulously surveyed the collections, creating a basic list of names and biographical information for the women she discovered. From there, Nelson, myself, and Bayard Miller, who couldn't be with us, conducted an expanded search in other history of science collections to discover additional names and connections between women scientists. Some male scientists were included on a subjective basis in our network. Short biographies were drafted for all the nodes in the network. The data was then restructured into network data in Python, resulting in a JSON used to power visualization written in D3.js. In the early days of researching for the network visualization, Sutherland combed through each page of our archival materials, reading for mentions of women working in science and noting their connections. This led to five very large nodes for each of the collections we looked at, predictably. However, other nodes also emerged that were less easy to predict, and we'll say a little bit about that below. It is also important to note in regards to the process of research and on the theme of collaboration that the stereotypical picture of a researcher working alone in the archive requesting materials from archivists who serve them to her does not apply here. Archivists were just as much a part of identifying materials to include, often suggesting unprocessed, unprocessed collections, material in other collections Sutherland would not have known about, and even authoring insights into why a certain collection might, not have, spotty might have spotty records. For instance, Rosemary Slater collection, she was a physicist who worked on the Manhattan Project, was very incomplete due to a fire that destroyed the early records of her career. In this way, Sutherland was not a lone researcher laboring independently. Collaboration was built into the process of research, design, and model building, especially as we considered the intended audiences of these products. The larger public via the website and visitors to the APS Museum um, where part of the visualization is featured. That's the people we were trying to meet, to reach with this. So with that, um, that concludes my portion. Um, so Serenity is now going to 
talk a little bit about what we found. So throughout our above description of the process, we've taken care to emphasize that the visualization is archival based and steeped in the research material present in the APS archives. At this point, the network only represents women found within the archives at the APS. While this may be a limitation for someone looking for a cohesive picture of women's involvement in science, it is actually a benefit for understanding the vast holdings at the APS. Two research questions informed this work from the beginning of the project. First, this project asks what connections might emerge from a network visualization demonstrating the lineages between women scientists? Would it broaden what we think of as science and our understanding of women's limited access to it and further illustrate what Londa Schrebinger, a historian of women in science, characterizes as the shifting landscapes of science and women's access to it? Second, by relying on the documents found in the papers of relatively well-known or highly successful women in science, can we triangulate the stories of other women in science who are less well-known and or who may be lost to our present day recounting of who did science? In response to the first question about what connections emerge in the visualization, I will show two brief examples. The Janet Howell Clark Network is an example of a node that emerged from the original six collections. Clark was an American physiologist and biophysicist and had connections with Florence Sabin, Florence Siebert, and Barbara McClintock, as well as many other scientists mentioned within the materials. She was a tireless advocate for women in science. One of the tools she used to help promote women in science was the Naples Table Association Ellen Swallow Richards Prize, which was named in honor of MIT chemist Ellen Swallow Richards. This opportunity funded a woman scientist for study at the Marine Biology Laboratory in Naples, Italy. Such experience was priceless for women who were often denied the opportunity to do laboratory work. Both the Janet Howell Clark Network that emerged from the collections, as well as the Naples Table Association network of applicants, reviewers, and references were part of the useful findings of women's work in science. For the second research question, the papers were a treasure trove of information about little known women in science or women who have yet to be part of the historical record for their contributions. While the network offers many examples, I've chosen just a few here to demonstrate not only how the network portrays little known women of science, but also the transnational stories about women's work in science that emerged from this research. First, Consuelo Vadillo, a physician from Merida in the Yucatan, won a scholarship from the American Association of University Women to study gynecological techniques at the Women's Medical College of Pennsylvania. Vidio returned to her home after her studies, and although little is known about her beyond what we have featured in her bio, she does inf inform a new node in the network. Second, Hannelore Diefenbach from Germany began her work in the US as a research technician with Mildred Cohn and later worked at the University of Melbourne in Australia. And in case you can't read the caption here, Mildred Cohn is quoted as saying, I advise young girls, get your doctorate before you get a husband. And the final example is Eva Soto Figueroa Leek, a woman from Mexico who through a fellowship awarded by the State Department came to the US to study pathology and would, would remain in the US teaching pathology at Wake Forest University. None of these women have Wikipedia entries and little is known about them within the print record. In this way, we maintain that our process of archival based network creation is a valuable methodology for the act of historical recovery. So I'm gonna wrap up here with some concluding thoughts. In our abstract for this panel, we write that, despite their utility in engaging the public, the methodologies of data visualization can sometimes remain controversial, and depending on usage, limited. At worst, they can be unreadable, and sometimes they oversimplify complex information. Scholars have referred to visualizations as sandcastles, tailored, unique, and often stunning, yet also transient and unstable interactive visualizations from Heinrich et al. Static portrayals of dynamic data that potentially oversimplify from Drucker, as we've already stated, and rhetorical framing devices that steer a viewer's interpretation from Holman and Diakopoulos. These are critiques we have attempted to contend with and move beyond in the examples provided above. 
If the tool engages in a form of sandcastling, helping us as researchers explore the collections and encouraging users to engage with the collections in a different way, its fragility as a sandcastle becomes most apparent in our collaboration with the APS Museum. While we originally discussed a fully interactive version of the visualization on a touch screen in the museum, this was quickly abandoned as untenable, and this is what it looks like now. Aside from the obvious technical concerns, there were some concerns about contextualization. The full visualization attempts to cohesively re represent a slice of the archival collections. Explaining something as complex as the archive or the historical, historical record in a museum panel for a general audience would be no easy task. Additionally, our project and the exhibition had different scopes. The visualization recovers many narratives not otherwise present in the historical record and therefore features many, many individuals, including those about whom little is known. The museum ex exhibition, on the other hand, focuses on a handful of women scientists. Many of the names in our network do not appear in the exhibition at all. In a way, the mu museum exhibition and our project have competing goals. While our project attempts to break down the heroine narrative by revealing the social contingencies of scientific work, the museum's exhibition still focuses on only a handful of women scientists due to limited space and only occasionally gesture to the broader social context. And this should hopefully play a little visualization of the network that people see when they come to the museum. Thus, the intervention of our network was crucial for the work of the museum so as not to reinscribe the narrative of the lone brilliant scientist and in terms of process, resist the narrative of the lone archival researcher. Such collaborative approaches and multiple considerations of audience engagement helped us tell a more holistic story about women in science. These interventions, though, had ramifications. For example, how to display the visualization for mu museum attendees. It would be impossible to display the visualization in its full form. So we've made this video that plays on an infinite loop highlighting several key nodes, most of whom were featured in the exhibition. In highlighting these nodes, we reveal additional names who are not featured in that museum exhibition showing the social contingency of scientific work. This in the end serves a contrary purpose to the role of the visualization in our project, which is the, to aid the discovery of lesser known narratives. Additionally, the graphic is not a network in any sense of the word and merely uses its visual form to suggest some type of interconnectedness. On the one hand, this collaboration speaks to the malleability of the visualization, which can adapt to different purposes and show narratives to different audiences. On the other hand, this shows the limitations of the visualization as a perspective on data, as Elijah Meeks argues, particularly in terms of interface and audience. A visualization may take on one meaning in one context, but may signify something entirely different in another. This is inherent to the process of sandcastling, which, help, which highlights the contingent exploratory nature of visualizations. And finally, another key point, in addition to that of the affordances and limitations of network visualizations, is the role of the archive itself. As academics, it is sometimes easy to view the archive as supremely authoritative. However, as Michel Rolf Trio reminds us, there are moments of silence in the process of archiving and preservation. And even the act of inclusion in the archive is itself an act of curation and power. Even still, when done thoughtfully and with acknowledgement of the limitations of our tools, the archive, the network visualization, the digital infrastructure on which these tools depend, we can begin to engage in the important work of recovery and communication to audiences who might otherwise not engage with topics like women in science. We believe this is the work of the humanities. Thank you. And if you'd like a museum brochure, just let me know.
Right. Hello, everyone. As Serenity mentioned, um, I'm working on a digital archive and a digital edition of a little known British anti slavery anthology called The Bow in the Cloud, which was edited by Marianne Rawson. Um, this is being supported by an NEH Mellon fellowship in digital publications, so I'm primarily trying to build this digital edition out. In the process of doing so, it has raised some interesting issues about data visualization. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, if you'd like to follow along, there's a link to the slides, which will take you to a Google Sheets document. Um, QR code also takes you to the same thing. Um, so I'll let you have a moment to pick that up. And while you're doing that, I'll just say that um, by way of background, the bow in the cloud was at the time the largest publication produced on anti-slavery writings at the time, 1834. So 1834 is a very interesting time for the abolitionist movement because it was just um, after the 1833 Slavery Abolition Act in Great Britain, which effectively abolished slavery, not only in Great Britain, but also in the colonies. There were still some loopholes, such as the East India Company could still you know, engage in slavery, which was quite bad. Um, but in any case, it was a significant victory for British abolitionists. But at the same time, American abolitionists, led in particular by William Lloyd Garrison, started a massive campaign to um, abolish slavery in the United States. That campaign was just getting started. It's my contention that the bow in the cloud may have influenced the way in which American abolitionists thought of their publishing program, because about 10 or so years after the bow in the cloud came out, we started seeing similar abolitionist anthologies that included poetry and prose and so on. This is um, a publisher's advertisement for the bow in the cloud. Um, it drew attention to the quality of the publication and it listed some of the more prominent authors. Many of these authors might not be known to you, um, but at the time, many of them were quite uh, prominent abolitionists and writers. Um, there were some attempts made to include very canonical authors that I'm sure all of you have heard of, like William Wordsworth, Robert Southey, and so on. They all declined to publish pieces in this anthology, which is itself a kind of interesting history. Um, just a little bit of background about how the book was made. Marianne Rawson, who was one of the founding members of the Sheffield Ladies Anti-Slavery Society, as a quite young woman decided to put together this anthology, she started soliciting contributions uh, from multiple people. It kind of stalled for reasons that are not entirely known, but by 1833, she had restarted the project, gained more submissions, um, and collected everything that she received. She even edited and prepared the whole anthology and collaborated with several other anti-slavery activists, which is partially why I'm on this panel, because this is, a, this is a project about collaboration and about a social network of anti-slavery activists. So in 1834, the anthology was published, consists of 85 poems and prose pieces. It was published by Jackson and Walford, which was a prominent publisher in London at the time. What's really fascinating about this anthology is not only its timing, it's not only that it was edited by a middle-class woman from the north of England, it also comes with a massive manuscript archive, over 600 items, mostly that were just collected by Ross and herself. And you see all kinds of interesting pieces of evidence, some of which I'll show you in a moment, but I'll start with this because this is a nice piece of, of evidence of the significance of this archive. Um, this is a letter from one of the contributors, Mary Sterndale, who noted the attractiveness of the publication, but also the solidity of purpose that it suggested by this grassroots collection of, of anti-slavery activists. Now, I mentioned that this is a project of collaboration and a social network. That's very well um, illustrated here by this wonderful portrait by Benjamin Hayden. If any of you happen to be in London, Go to the National Portrait Gallery. It has just been reopened. It's been renovated. And this portrait is, in, is on display, and it's absolutely massive and fascinating. And on the right-hand side, second row, 
the woman with the bonnet. That's Marianne Rawson. Um, Thomas Clarkson is prominently featured giving a speech. But well, this is a collection of anti-slavery activists from the 1840 Anti-Slavery Convention, which shows you the potentials of mapping out all these relationships. Now, how can you do that? I'll get to that in a moment. But again, just to show you how interesting this um, manuscript ar archive can be, this is a poem by Ann Taylor, um, who at the time was a very prominent children's author. Um, on the left side, you can see the published version of the poem. On the right side, the manuscript version, which was copied out by Rawson. But we also have interesting illustrations. So here, there's um, a, a watercolor, I believe, that was done by Ann Taylor, submitted with her poem. It wasn't published in the final anthology, but it's in the archive. So we can recover things like this. Here's another piece. I mentioned Mary Sterndale earlier. She submitted this pencil drawing that was meant to be accompanied by one of her pieces. This was also not published in the anthology, but it's in the archive. This is an interesting example of Marianne Rawson's own preface. We've got two full drafts of the preface, which shows her really struggling to articulate how she should present herself and the nature of the project coming at a time when they were meant to be commemorating the 1833 Anti-Slavery um, Act, but also how they can influence universal abolition, particularly in the United States. But we also see in the archive really interesting bits like this, which is a note that accompanied the preface where she explicitly mentions her gender and sounds very unapologetic about the nature of her enterprise. This was never published, and in fact, in the final published anthology, her gender is not referenced anywhere. Her name doesn't appear anywhere. It's as if she didn't do any of the work in the final published version, but in the archive, there's evidence like this, which shows that she was actually thinking quite hard about how to present herself. Now, we also have in the manuscript archive evidence of collaboration. So here is a letter from the Reverend um, J.W.H. Pritchard, who's suggesting a change to the preface. This um, phrase doesn't appear in either of the preface drafts that I just showed you. Um, but clearly, she was influenced by his suggestion to make a change in the published version or what became the published version of the preface. This is one of the most interesting forms of collaboration that I've found so far in the manuscript archive. This is an extract from a letter by Thomas Buxton, who is one of the most prominent MPs um, who represented abolitionism. Um, if we look in the archive, we can see him explicitly designating where the extract should be taken from a letter that he sent to Rawson. I've circled it here and here. Rawson then copied out that extract, and you can see she deleted bits from the beginning, so that shows evidence of her own editing, which is interesting. But this is even more interesting, which is she redrafted the beginning of the extract in pencil on a separate sheet. And here, she's making more revisions herself. So we see Rawson doing quite a bit of editing, showing her agency as an editor. This is all being resurfaced through the collaborative nature of this archive. So this got me to thinking about how digital tools can be used to represent not only the social networks, but also the collaborations that we're finding in this manuscript archive and in this anthology. So um, I was inspired by the ideas of Ruth Honert and Sebastian Honert, um, Catherine Nicole Coleman and Scott Weingart, talking about the network turn and the way in which we can measure relationships of complex systems. But also they emphasize that collaboration and exchange among practitioners and scholars are absolutely crucial to making this happen. So I was thinking about using network analysis of, very kind, of, of various kinds, but also um, influenced by Michael Gavin's recent work in literary mathematics, where he calls for a working theory of the corpus. that's grounded in mathematics, but also sensitive to the, his, the textual histories and archival histories of source documents. He bases his work on three principles, which I think dovetail nicely with the network turn. And these are the principle of homophily, uh, distributional hypothesis, and spatial autocorrelation, auto which generally mean that 
words, ideas, places, and people tend to cluster together. And that becomes the basis for thinking not only about um, raising these textual histories, but also thinking about how things are connected, how we can measure the connections, and how we can develop new theories of things like anti-slavery from manuscript archives. Of course, putting this into practice is hard. Um, and one of the ways that I'm currently thinking about building prototypes for this kind of work is using a content management system called Scalar. Some of you may have heard of it. It's an open source semantic web authoring and publishing platform for born digital scholarship. Um, and I started thinking about using Scalar to chart um, a kind of network analysis, which I'm calling textual paths. And that's using the general technology that Scalar has for creating paths, which is arranging pages in the, um, in the project through relationships in linear and nonlinear ways. But it also attempts to balance the standardization that we get from metadata standards, um, as well as f the flexibility of free text tagging and annotations. Because every page and every piece of content in Scalar has its own database ID, it facilitates interconnections among content of both standardized and non-standardized identifications. Now, this does raise an interesting question about how important it is for us to get the mathematical precision of, say, the distance between nodes and edges and the weight of nodes and edges and so on. We already heard about that in the first talk, that it's, it's fuzzy, it's fuzzy at best. <laughs> and sometimes we have to have a flexible idea of what constitutes a network. And perhaps with a smaller collection, like say 650 manuscript items, um, the mathematical precision that you might get might not be as important as charting um, more uh, flexibly tagged um, content, for example. So this gives you a sense of what the digital edition kind of looks like right now. Um, I just showed you the Thomas Buxton piece, Compensation for the Slave. It's on the site now. Um, it has a link to the TEI XML source document, which is on GitHub. But at the end, you also see the textual paths. The paths consist both of um, tags that take you to a list of pages that are referenced by that tag, as well as a contents path list, which takes you to all of the manuscripts related to that published piece. In this case, you get all three of the versions that I just showed you um, relating to Buxton's extract. But what you can also think of is creating a network out of this more sort of traditional look of a scholarly edition, right? Um, and this got me thinking that instead of focusing on the network as a kind of mathematical operation, what if we thought of it as a kind of index? Um, and this got me to um, thinking about Dennis Duncan's wonderful new book um, on the history of the index. And you can see that the way that the index is constructed does relate quite a bit to uh, what we think about networks. Um, and, of course, Duncan points out that the index itself is a, is a, a terrific technology that not only made codex reading easier, but it was also used in the construction of the internet, right? Um, because it implies a kind of spatial relationship between discrete bits of knowledge that we want to find quickly. And of course, when you're searching Google, you're not searching the web technically, you're searching the index of the web, right? So um, networks are kind of interesting um, through way into thinking about um, networks. Um, but also, some of the book historians in the room know this, but just to remind you that there is a difference between a concordance index and a subject index. And most of us are familiar in digital tools with concordance style indexes. But what I'm trying to do is to kind of move away from the concordance style index in thinking about networks and moving toward more of a subject index. Um, so how can we use digital tools to leverage the benefits of subject indexes instead of simply counting the instances of a word or a place or any other kind of semantic category um, and think more about um, sort of semantic, uh, thematic ideas uh, that a subject index facilitates. 
So one tool that Scalar allows me to use is um, various network analyses tools. This is a nice um, example of a subject index dendogram um, which shows all the pieces in the project so far that are associated with Quakers. I mentioned Quakers because Thomas Buxton was himself a prominent Quaker. So he's been tagged as a Quaker, but he's also con uh, connected here with other authors in the anthology who were Quakers. So that starts to get you to think about the way in which Quaker authors spoke similarly and where they came from um, because they're also tagged with their place names. And we can also produce this network style visualization. Um, it's non-hierarchical, it's not weighted, so it doesn't tell you, you know, who in the network is more prominent, but it does give you a good example of the connections that are established between these pages. So you can see here the Quaker node is visualized as well as um, the Thomas Buxton piece. And it gives you a, a set of relationships between not only the, the red dots, which are the tags, but also media pieces, which are green dots, um, as well as scholarly edited texts, which are the blue dots. And this allows you to kind of facilitate your way through the edition in a nonlinear way, using this kind of network as a subject index. Um, if you're following along, uh, this link will take you to the data visualization prototypes. And um, I should say it's very much in progress still. It's not even close to done. I still have 10 months left on my, on my fellowship. So um, check back with me in 10 months if you're really interested to see how it's going to turn out. Um, but uh, to finish off, I just want to say too that it's really important to note that in addition to visualizing anti-slavery collaborators, I also had a lot of wonderful colleagues to collaborate with and I've listed them here just to uh, make sure that it's clear that this is not just me doing this work, this is a collection of librarians and scholars and facilitators of various kinds. Thank you very much. So uh, I'd like to uh, thank the conference organizers, thank all of you for being here, and also thank Serenity for asking me to um, join this panel. Uh, Re-envisioning Japan, Japan as destination in 20th century visual and material culture, or we call it REG for short, is an open-ended research and teaching project that encompasses an original collection of primarily 20th century travel, education, and leisure ephemera, representing changing perceptions of Japan and its place in the world, and an open access multimedia digital archive first launched in 2013. The project evolved organically over the past 20 years from individual research to an interinstitutional, in this case, uh, university and archive, and multidisciplinary faculty, library, and student collaboration. And I want to again acknowledge Serenity as a key collaborator on the digital archive while also TAing for Tourist Japan, which is Reg's uh, dedicated companion course. 
As a hybrid project grounded in a unique relationship between the material world and digital space, Reg's objectives are recuperative, interpretive, and generative, focused on related social activities, contingent on the circulation, exchange, and interpretation of things through space and across time. The project also redefines ephemeral objects as important resources helping us rethink received narratives about Japan, how it was promoted and perceived during each object's time. I start by introducing the uh, Reg physical archive, um, physical collection, because its diverse range of media determined the project's parameters and purpose. Next, I focus on the collaborative, iteratively built digital archive with three examples of visualization tools that we designed for it. A customized viewing window for streaming audiovisual media, object encounters, which are visual explorations of objects inspired by Brownian material cultural analysis, and Mediate, a media annotation tool. These features enhance interactive engagement with and interpretation of the digital surrogates that we created for the collection through a process of reiteratively exploring how to best represent their materiality in a two-dimensional environment. Many collaborative relationships made REG possible and continue to sustain it. Its development as a DH project parallels the emergence of a dedicated digital scholarship unit within the River Campus Library's system, and the digital archive was made possible by the incentive, support, and multidisciplinary expertise of my digital scholarship department colleagues. The projects also benefited from work by undergraduates, graduate students, and postdocs in Japan studies, film and media, digital media, visual and cultural studies, anthropology, art history, English, and notably uh, the Selznick Graduate Program in Film Preservation, an interinstitutional collaboration between uh, the University of Rochester and George Eastman Museum's Moving Image Department. I spent a year uh, on sabbatical participating in this program, learning these skills and uh, collection management as well. And the uh, moving image department has been an important collaborator, providing access to films in its collection, some of which are now included in the archive. Students in Reg's companion course, Cherish Japan, also engage with uh, and contribute to the digital archive, drawing on their diverse backgrounds and uh, disciplines. The Reg physical uh, collection and digital archive are their primary texts, and their assignments add to the project's critical contextualization. Um, I can't refer to this course in detail here, but the syllabus is available online, along with a more comprehensive list of project collaborators over the years. And I have to say, one of the interesting things about this project is that so many people have uh, come to me with um, personal souvenirs, um, things that have been passed down through their families, um, very interesting stories behind them, um, and some donations have been made to the library to um, be added to the collection. I've, I've deeded the collection to the rare books, and it'll eventually reside there and be stewarded um, there in proximity to the archive. Um, so moving on to the physical um, co uh, collection, the project began as an extension of my work in silent film, a medium with an unprecedented ability to defy language barriers and spatial and temporal boundaries, drawing attention to how circulating objects and images with mass appeal transcend cultural borders, complicating assumptions about different socioeconomic, cultural, and political identities. Researching and writing about these films, I learned how the ancillary ephemeral resources can contextualize such films, reanimating their world and the images they portrayed. So I started collecting things that might bring to life the material I research and teach, things that I could use in class to teach the humanistic critical skills we use to discern an object's meaning 
beyond its immediate use and how that meaning changes over time and according to context. So the project is object-based and object-driven. Things I collect determine subsequent lines of inquiry. This process of making through inquiry resembles Jules David Brown's step-by-step -step approach to interpreting material culture that advances from face value description to deduction, speculation, and interpretation. And uh, I'm actually gonna circle back to this because in 2016, um, Serenity's cohort of DH fellows and I designed a prototype for digital uh, visualizations that um, are actually visualizations of object interpretation as an exploratory rather than explanatory process. Uh, there are a series of images with minimal narrative text that visualize in digital space the experiential process that occurs when the questions we ask of an object amplify its meaning, transforming a singular experience into knowledge on a broader scale. The Reg collection is broadly heterogeneous in format as a corpus for teaching and research, documenting personal experience, cross-cultural encounters, and changing representations of Japan over most of the 20th century. Objects range from postcards, photographs, sheet music, travel literature guides, uh, other print ephemera, to glass magic lantern slides, films, and other 3D objects. I started by collecting postcards, and they are still the largest category by format represented in the collection. The correlation between postcards and early cinema's popular forms of media, evidence of place, and embodiments of image and movement help define the project's main hierarchical categories, and these became the basis for the prototype digital archives organizational schema mirroring the intellectual work behind collecting and curating the physical collection. The predominance of collection objects from the first decades of the 20th century reflects uh, Japan's growth as an imperial power, the worldwide rise of mass tourism, and the long reach of Japan's official branch of government, charge, of government charged with promoting the country as a tourist destination by targeting a North American and an European clientele. And this is something that made tourism promotion in Japan different um, from most other countries at the time, the fact that it was all government regulated and government um, incited. Changing patterns and demographics in inward and outward bound tourism and trade and the dominance of still and moving photographic images partly determine the project's chronological breadth from the late 1800s through the 1970s. And as you can see here, much of the collection comprises examples of representational practices promoting Japan abroad and personal objects like souvenirs that might embody narratives suggesting the individual experiences of those who made or used them. And I think that the um, Centennial Exhibit souvenir uh, from the Japan Pavilion in 1976 is the oldest object um, in the collection. The button pin is interesting because it's actually Rochester produced. Um, the glass lantern slides are by a well-known photographer and are the property of the Visual Studies Workshop in Rochester. I've selected some vintage postcards that help illustrate the collection's orientation, um, the breadth of postcard genres and major themes, patterns, and recurrent motifs informed a framework for the collection. I started collecting postcards of cities and sites as visual records of place, and in this case, uh, urban landscapes on the left. These led to postcards like those on the right, unique surviving traces of relationships, often between Japanese pen pals, usually young schoolboys, and English language counterparts. Japan's presence at international expositions and world's fairs quickly emerged as another important category um, in the upper left-hand corner. And I never cease to be amazed by the number of transplanted representations of Japan, such as the two postcards on the right. Um, we have Japan, Japanese gardens, villages, or even this Revere Beach, Massachusetts, imaginary Japan, complete with its own Mount Geisha and free admission. 
Uh, in the lower left is an example of a travel-themed postcard issued by NYK, Nippon Yusen Kaisha, Japan's largest passenger and cargo shipping company. NYK issued ephemera, including postcards, menus, passenger lists, and entertainment programs, uh, is notably abundant and artfully designed. As one of um, the project's main subject categories, travel generates such a vast diversity of objects that I've added some additional examples here. On the left, a government-issued brochure, and on the right, two more uh, NYK uh, items. And finally, uh, here's a postcard uh, written and delivered on the same day that com comments on the weather, a reminder of the different cadence of life over a century ago when mail was delivered several times a day and postcards were kind of like email, only prettier. Um, slides 10 and 11, um, this slide and the next slide, segue to the digital archive by demonstrating more broadly the collection's various formats and themes. And at this point, you might think I had a well-formed organizational framework before we built the digital archive, but uh, in truth, such a critical framework only clearly emerged after we started collaborating on how to best display the collection in digital space. So uh, the collaborative phase began when I asked library colleagues for advice on digiting, uh, digitizing parts of the collection to facilitate student access outside of class. I was texting with my daughter today, and she said, you know, what are you presenting on? I said, uh, re-envisioning Japan, you know, otherwise known as that stuff in the attic that I keep, you know, carrying back and forth to class. Um, and in no time, as, as soon as I asked for this help, um, all of a sudden we were all working together to design a digital archive. Uh, and this work was really transformative. Uh, it allowed me to benefit from various perspectives and compelled all of us to question the boundaries of our respective disciplines, the definition of humanities research, pedagogy, and conventional modes of scholarship. In designing the prototype WordPress archive um, that went live in 2013, we drew on Carol Palmer's idea of a thematic research collection, a web-based resource in which scholarship is embedded in both the product and its use. Making decisions about representation through considerations of interface, display, and materiality, we prioritized first digitizing the collection's diverse formats to best represent each object's unique materiality, and second, creating a digital archive that went beyond recuperation and access to generating new pathways for discovery, connection, collaboration, and reuse. Designing the WordPress site was useful. Um, it was a learning process that informed our subsequent uh, 20, actually 2017 migration to Omeka, which facilitated consistent, detailed, and standard-based metadata. We also had more flexibility in designing collaborative student assignments. Um, we, we could ask students to build um, collaborative exhibits and uh, create metadata together. I grow uneasy each time someone refers to REG as one of the library's legacy projects because it's still very much a work in progress. And in fact, in the coming year, we're migrating it again to Omeka S. Um, this will better ensure its sustainability and will provide some other opportunities that um, go beyond my scope here. But this is just a short summary of some of the reasons why we moved to Omeka. Um, and you can actually see better in the next slide here, uh, the image behind is the way this particular object, a piece of sheet music, appeared in um, WordPress. The metadata was attached to the object, so it was closed. It could not link out. Um, now we have that possibility, um, and all of the things that we could do in WordPress, we can do, but, but more. Uh, and this is also an example, um, excuse me, I just lost my 
um, thing here. This is also an example of how we really paid attention to the materiality. Um, Japan-inspired sheet music is a prominent example of early uh, Japanese influence on 20th uh, century American popular culture. And I got funds to uh, commission original recordings of about 25, 45 of the approximately 200 um, titles in my collection. Um, and even with the archive's first WordPress edition, we experimented with page turning apps and ways to make these recordings accessible, um, enhancing their display. And so I'll just play a little bit, oops, play a little bit here, back. So um, users just have to go to the button and um, they'll get an uh, entire recording of the object. So films were very important to the project. I wasn't going to collect them until I realized um, there was no good reason not to and many good reasons too. Uh, so the collection includes over 200 small gauge films. So this is Super 8, Regular 8, and 16 millimeter um, films about or related to Japan, including stock footage, cartoons, documentaries, educational films, um, amateur travel films, uh, promotional films, and secondary market films made for home entertainment. The custom designed viewer for streaming films was built using VideoJS. Um, I'm just gonna move to that. Uh, which is open source and all customizations were uh, done using OpenCV, open source um, computer vision. This is just an example of one of the two ways that you can access films. First, from the uh, main menu. And this is just about 40 seconds long. Not all of the films that you see here represented by a thumbnail are digitized because I'm still um, investigating copyright. But this is a 1920 film by Keystone um, for home entertainment called Picturesque Japan. And this is the timeline that we built. Uh, which shows you the particular um, viewing window a little bit better. Um, you can access films directly from the timeline. Um, I'm just gonna move in a little bit. Okay, now you see the um, video. It's kind of small, the viewing window. We open it up to a bigger view. Uh, you can't really see up in the upper right-hand corner of the window, but there are four different choices for um, frames per second. Um, this is a uh, probably a 1900s, uh, more or less 1905 film that was reprinted in the 1960s, probably transferred at 24 frames per second when it was hand cranked manually, and that's why it looks so fast. So you can actually watch it at 20, 12 frames per second and it looks perfectly normal. So this was a really good um, thing to have. And this next slide just shows you that process of choosing what speed you wanna watch the excerpt at. Um, this was uh, designed by uh, a graduate of the Selznick um, School of Film Preservation. Um, I'm not gonna show you the whole uh, object encounter because it's available on the um, web and I'm at time, but just a little bit of it to give you an idea. And we worked so hard on this. Um, I mean, it looks completely intuitive, but it's so funny how your mind will want to jump immediately to what is it, you know, and come out with a really big elaborate explanation when it's so much more interesting when you build step by step um, and then you kind of get to the end here uh, after you figure out what it is and we end with a kind of, um, you know, summation of what the object is. So if you'd like to take a look at it, there's also student examples um, on the web. And finally, um, this is a um, 
capture of the interface for media um, where you can, it's, it's very easy to use and you can also customize your own um, schema so you can have students uh, be annotating for film uh, style as well as for cultural um, annotation. And uh, my last uh, two slides here, this is um, some of the contextuality that's arisen now after 23 years of collecting. Um, and that's what we're going to address as we move on to Omeka S, which will give us a little bit more flexibility to link out and, and link within as well. Um, and there are some um, articles that I've written that give you more detail on the project. And um, I'm happy to share the slides with anyone. And thank you very much. All right, hello everyone. Uh, I just want to quick say thank you to the people on my panel for Serenity for bringing us all together and for the people who are organizing this conference for taking such good care of us. Um, my name is uh, Candace Hawk and I'm an associate professor at SUNY Oswego, the State University of New York in Oswego. Uh, and I'm a South Asian specialist in the history department. Um, and uh, yeah, today I'll be discussing a methodology that I've developed. So it's a two-part digital spatial analysis methodology for investigating um, sacred landscapes that center on um, visualization from a devotee's perspective. Uh, now, this methodology was developed for application to uh, the early medieval landscape of Hampi, which is in Karnataka in uh, South India. So, uh, by combining the analytical dexterity of GIS uh, to create time-sensitive digital reconstruction maps of Humpy, um, coupled with the immersive capabilities of Google Street View, I found new trends in the use of landscape um, in architecture, in, in all these things are, are detectable when two platforms kind of come together. Um, and I'm finding uh, changes included um, that include uh, manipulation and management of uh, devotee corporeal experience. So, on our journey today, I'll provide a bit of background uh, to contextualize the space and place under investigation. Uh, following this, I'll present my methodology, and I'm going to support that with a discussion uh, of a case study. So we'll look at a 12th century Mula Virapaksha temple using this methodology. All right, so uh, the research uh, that I'm talking about today is part of uh, my much broader research project in uh, early medieval uh, sacred landscape in Hampi. Um, and this is prior to its transformation into the uh, imperial capital city of the Vijayanagara Empire. So um, on the slide here, you can uh, see the, the section that I'm looking at and how it sort of fits into the much broader later capital city. Um, and the capital city basically explodes to be home to about half a million people by 1500. But we're not looking at that. We're going back much, much earlier. Okay, so the earliest um, architectural evidence at Hampi in the form of stone shrines uh, dated back to the 9th century establishes that this, in fact, was a pilgrimage site um, that was dedicated to the river goddess Pampa. Uh, and indeed, we have um, epigraphic evidence that goes back even before that to about 689, 690 um, that corroborates this. So it establishes that this was indeed an early tantric Shaivite pilgrimage site dedicated to Pampa, that, that river goddess. Um, so as was typical in early medieval uh, sort of tantric tradition, um, the goddess Pampa was paired with a Bhairava. So this is a fierce type of a god, uh, often a, 
a guardian of sorts. And uh, the most famous example of another Bhairava is Kala Bhairava from Kashi. And um, he was known as the Black Terror. So he ended up taking over the duties of the god of death. So, um, and at Hampi, indeed, we do have Pampa and Bhairava. Um, sort of providing this, their own site with um, corporeal and soterological uh, death-related services. So uh, fortunately at Humpy, we have uh, a really unusually high level of uh, preservation and integrity of artifacts uh, that ordered space so that the experience of movement um, at the site can be identified and discussed with confidence in terms of how space was configured and manipulated in the past. So additionally, uh, the Hemakata Hill, where the religious architecture for the early medieval period was concentrated, is uh, very nicely contained. Um, it's a nicely contained space that's observably and conceptually distinct from the surrounding area. The hill itself, um, on the screen behind me here, is a Precambrian granitic outcrop, um, and it has very little sediment deposition on it, uh, but it has lovely shallow undulations. Um, and this created uh, very natural paths of movement that we can detect. Uh, plus, the boundaries of the hill are quite clear. So we have either uh, boundaries being demarcated by large clusters of massive boulders or very steep drop-offs. Um, however, this is not the case at the north end of the hill. Uh, the north end of the hill, the foot sort of um, transitions seamlessly to a nice flat area where a lot of temples and shrines have sort of um, been situated. Um, and then beyond this small cluster, about 200 meters further north than that is the Tungabhadra River. So overall, um, what I should say is that the Hemakata Hill area is a setting that's really characterized uh, by microtopographic features that are incredibly difficult, if not impossible, to detect through satellite imagery. Um, so from around 800 CE to the 12th century, um, the conceptual and spatial organization of the site was centered on these two deities I've mentioned, Pampa and Bhairava. Um, so Bhairava, he is, and his temple are situated at the north, or sorry, at the south end of the site. So um, the south cardinal direction is often associated with um, death, and it's sort of an in, inauspicious direction. However, Pampa, she's located at the very north end of the site, in auspicious direction, very close to the river. Uh, and as the earliest temples of the site, they established um, a very clear south-north um, access of organization and of devotee movement across this sacred space. Um, so in between them, we have small memorial shrines that sort of popped up and clustered around Pampa, um, and they were part of a cult of ancestors that was being practiced um, pretty much throughout southern uh, India at this point as well. However, come to the 12th century, uh, there was a dramatic shift uh, in the religious life of the site, and this is very much reflected in the spatial organization that we see and to the architectural traditions. So this shift was driven uh, by the addition of two temples to the Hemakata Hill area, uh, belonging to a newly imported god. So this was a Sanskritic god from the Brahmanical pantheon um, and a form of Shiva. So this is Virupaksha. Now through Virupaksha, this small um, but locally important pilgrimage site um, becomes all of a sudden the center for this new cult, for this Virupaksha cult, and also it's attracting much more um, devotees and pilgrims to come to, uh, to Hampi. So with uh, his introduction, as I said, two temples are, are uh, constructed for him. One temple is located at the base of the hill, situated between Pampa and Bhairava, um, thus sort of mediating the space and the relationship that was established at the sort of origin of the site. Um, and under uh, patronage of the later Vijnagra imperial rulers, this particular temple is going to be developed into a massive temple complex. And I've outlined that footprint in yellow on the map. 
But today I'd like to focus on the second Virupaksha temple, um, and this is the Mula Virupaksha temple, and it's located on the hill, on the granitic surface of the hill, um, roughly adjacent to Bhairava, so in the south, um, on a lovely sort of southeast crest of the hill. And this temple, temple initially appears uh, architecturally and stylistically um, unassuming, especially when you're looking at it on uh, a GIS. So the sacred Hampi landscape from the outset, um, uh, pilgrimage site, it, it was infused deeply by ideas of purity and salvation and death, which is most tangibly crystallized by that south-north um, axis uh, between the Bhairava temple and the Pampa temple. So, and as an active pilgrimage site, devotees would have interacted and moved through space in sort of a ritually prescribed fashion. Uh, thus, my methodology focuses on devotee movement and corporeal experience, um, particular to a ritually charged time and space. So if movement and experience are considered as, say, universal mechanisms through which humans order space, they can therefore be examined as being sensorial and bound together. Um, and more importantly, they are observable and traceable through material culture, um, through material features such as topography and through the built and natural environment. For my research, I began using um, Esri's arc map as my GIS of choice to digitize this landscape, um, and I created shapefiles for the structures that existed within my period of interest, um, plus I digitized uh, micrograph microtopographic and just regular topographic features. Um, and I found a lot of these uh, microtopographic features primarily by uh, in-person ground truthing, but also through analysis in uh, Google Street View. And importantly, GIS is where I could associate these features um, with attribute data that I could then query later on. So having digitized this, this whole landscape, uh, a non-static investigation of the early medieval period sort of phase by structural phase was undertaken so that spatial and temporal patterns and processes could start to be identified and visualized, um, including paths of movement. So mapping and visualizing devotee movement trajectories in a digitized landscape coupled with an analysis of topography, such as how and when the body encountered material features, uh, along with revelations of visible and invisible information, permitted me to assess devotee corporeal experience. So with this framework in mind, uh, GIS provided the ultimate platform for cataloging and visualizing and historically situating data for analysis. Uh, once my time-sensitive maps had been generated, uh, the routes devotees walked were then investigated through Google Street View. Um, and this was done for a refined an analysis of sensorial engagement of the historical body and the materiality of place. And by using these two very different tools, one, uh, a spatial analysis from an allocentric perspective that codes relative to external features of the environment through GIS, and two, uh, through a spatial analysis from an egocentric perspective through Google Street View that's tied to the observer. Um, these were both sort of brought together. So I'm incredibly unfortunate uh, to be working at a point in time that Google um, expanded Google Street View, or, or just Street View, um, their project to many UNESCO World Heritage Sites, um, including Humpy and the broader Vijanagara landscape. Um, so as you can see on the slide, um, the Street View imagery for the Hemukata Hill area is exceptionally robust, and all the paths that were taken for uh, recording imagery are highlighted in blue. So if you're not too familiar with Google Street View, um, it's a series of panoramic images that are sort of stitched together um, and that provide a 360 degree view horizontally and a 180 degree view uh, vertically. Um, and uh, you know, the viewer can move through these paths um, that the photographer has taken, uh, almost seamlessly transitioning through each series of 360 degree um, locations. So I think also most of us know about the Google cars that drive around and record Google Street View images, um, but Google also has a backpack for recording the same images that allows them to move through hard to access landscapes, which is what was used here. 
So as a tool for this research, uh, Google Street View has facilitated remote access to ground level visibility of the site and provides that egocentric, humanistic perspective for investigation while simultaneously permitting the identification of invisible uh, landscape features not discernible through satellite imagery or through GIS. And it's clear that these types of things, these would have guided um, and oriented and been perceptible to a devotee moving through space during the early medieval period, like those microtopographic features that fully characterize the Hemakata Hill. Additionally, the quality uh, of worship in temple spaces, um, particularly outside of shrines and often on a, a porch or a mandapa uh, of a temple, is a very much an active process. Um, the devotee is seeking in part to gaze upon the mirti, the uh, image of the god, right? Um, and when they do so, they enter into darshan, and this is a reciprocal relationship with that deity. Uh, the devotee gazes at the god, and the god in turn gazes back. Um, so. Uh, having a methodology that takes movement and sight into consideration is really an analytically powerful tool for a religious context um, in that the devotee is not framed as passive or static. Um, so prior to the Virupaksha cult's um, introduction to the Hampi sacred space, temple and shrine architecture and spatial planning concerns were pretty limited um, to a structure's physical and visual accessibility. Mainly, they wanted to be close to Pampa, right? Unless you were the Bhairava temple, the Bhairava temple um, tried to sort of hide itself within a small microtopic, uh, microtopographic depression. However, during um, the 1100 to 1250 period, new patterns of architectural activity were uh, established. So these included changes to spatial organization and movement, um, but also um, to monument additions, and all of these were really focused on that new cult, the Virupaksha cult. So the uh, Mula Virupaksha temple was built using the very austere sort of famsana architectural uh, language that was previously used by memorial shrines. So this did two things very well for um, the, the temple. By using the famsana language, by the, using the famsana tradition, the temple itself established a link to the oldest architectural tradition at the site and this sort of naturalized it within this space. And two, um, through the subtle use of spatial organization and orientation, it also represents a thoroughly novel design for Hampi religious architecture and ushered in a period of really sophisticated and unprecedented temple planning that incorporated natural landscape topographic features and self-references. So for example, uh, the temple was strategically situated to appropriate a very striking microtopographic feature of the hill, and it was built immediately up in front of and abutting a small spring-fed cistern, which you can see on the slide. So to accomplish this, um, the temple was oriented east-northeast, so about 83 degrees from north. Um, and this is not necessarily um, a weird <laughs> or red flag uh, orientation uh, for this site, but traditionally one enters into a temple via this longitudinal access. Um, but as you can see here, uh, the orientation of the temple means that the stairs that you normally would have used to enter into the temple, they go right into the water. So devotees aren't entering there. Uh, so with this east-northeast um, temple orientation, the devotee can only enter and exit through that south-north um, access, um, entering into the porch, into the mandapa, which mirrors the north-south flow of movement through the larger pilgrimage space, um, from the hill to the river, from Berava to Pampa. And of course, again, this is the original prescribed path of movement through the sacred space that those two original deities had established. Uh, and Google Street View captures the devotee's sightline when they exit the porch, um, which intentionally directed their gaze at the other, the second Mula Virpa, or sorry, the second Virupaksha temple, the much larger one, and just beyond it, the Pampa temple. So you're getting this sensorial or ocular um, and physical relationship being established in the devotee's mind between Virupaksha and Pampa, again, naturalizing this relationship. 
Uh, so Google Street View also shows us that uh, when in the temple space, this unique porch plan frames and directs devotees sight lines um, if you turn away from the Murti to the cistern and to the much broader sacred landscape and the sacred hills beyond. Um, so when the devotee arrives for darshan, the movement and noise of the landscape is behind the temple. And this creates a space for introspection, for worship, for potentially um, uh, a profound connection with uh, the Virupaksha uh, at, that, at that temple space, but also for the larger sacred landscape. So this series of intentional design decisions by the temple artisans work together to naturalize the monument into the fabric uh, of the sacred Hemakata Hill, Hill space and uh, to be a powerful place to connect to a new deity. So uh, what I found is that uh, important cultural and invisible features that structured the Hampi landscape were microtopographic features that can be observed through Google Street View. In this way, GIS um, is used to record spatial temporal footprints of features, both built and natural, while Google Street View allows for the space to be more than a passive media, but an active agent. The moral of this story, I guess, um, is that when interested in the development and use of space known to be sacred to the group living and building it, um, the element of perspective is an access point worth considering um, to sort of tap into religious experience. Uh, humanistic perspective is, of course, absent from a fixed bird's eye view in a GIS-generated map. Um, so the seemingly pedestrian Google Street View can be quite powerful as it provides the opportunity to be a mobile body in space uh, as a center perspective that you know, traditional GIS just doesn't provide. Um, and, and that is my, my, my story. Thank you for going on the journey with me. Thank you very much. Uh, we do have just a few minutes for questions, so I'm going to invite the panelists to come up uh, so that we can uh, answer some questions. Uh, we have about three. We can maybe extend it to five minutes, but lunch is waiting, so we don't want to cut into it. Uh, so do we have um, the microphone to pass around? Any questions? Uh, we have uh, in the front here. Sure, so we'll do one question and then we'll move on. So uh, we have a question in the front. Thanks very much for your presentations. Uh, I had a question more targeted at the first presentation. You mentioned wanting to address archival rhetoric and kind of the silences, ambiguities, and gaps. Can you expand a bit on how you did that, and specifically if you experimented at all with visual representations of ambiguities and absences? Yeah, I guess I can uh, attempt a, an answer to that. So. Um, we didn't really experiment with um, visual representations of it because we, um, we, we, it's difficult to know what we have and what we don't have. I think what we, we wanted to represent the archive as it exists, which is a problem for us. We know in some cases that there's correspondence that should exist that doesn't exist because we, or we know there are connections that should exist but don't exist. Um, we didn't want to put that in the network because then it would um, obviously imply something that just was not in our archive. Um, so it's, I think, a problem. Um, there are ways we could have experimented with it. Um, we frame this more in some of the paratextual material we wrote around the visualization, talking about things that we didn't find, things that were destroyed. Barbara McClintock destroyed a lot of her papers, for instance. Um, but now, unfortunately, we didn't really uh, come up with a visual representation. But I would say in response to the, we didn't represent it visually, but we did create uh, some things we called data stories. And we didn't get into that here because we didn't have time. But if we go to the site, there's a page dedicated to gaps and silences where we do discuss um, some of the findings in the material. Uh, for example, we found a drawing of a Henrietta Lacks cell and how that is really representative of the gaps and silences in the archives. And while it's not represented visually, it is represented within the experience of the site in and of itself. 
All right, thank you so much, everyone. I think I cursed us by saying we'd have lots of time for questions, which is the curse of all moderators should never say that, uh, because we did not. But uh, thank you so much, and I invite you to come and talk to us if you have any additional questions, and uh, have a great rest of your day.